Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. We are grateful to you for being such fantastic listeners. Thank you for your continuous support. So far, we've launched 129 episodes since February 2020. Let's revisit a previous interview while we record new podcast episodes with your favorite GPCR scientists. Before we dive into this one, we would like to take a moment and thank our Dr. GPCR ecosystem partners for their support, namely Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. Did you hear? We are working hard to bring you the Dr. GPCR University. It's a program where you'll be able to take a course on your favorite topic or even create a course to share with the community. For that matter, we are looking for experts to create courses on anything GPCR related and can't wait to unveil these to the Dr. GPCR community. Enter your course and you'll get a chance to win a cash prize for the most voted course in the ecosystem. Stay tuned and keep, out, keep an eye out for our wait list in the Dr. GPCR monthly newsletter. Become a Dr. GPCR Ecosystem Premium member and enjoy re-watching all the Dr. GPCR Summit and Symposia talks, the video cast of our podcast, and soon take a course at the Dr. GPCR University. You can also message members privately and network with our community from all over the world. And now let's revisit this fantastic episode. Hello everyone, today we are speaking with Dr. J. Silvio Gutkin. He is currently a professor of pharmacology and associate director of basic science at the University of California, San Diego. And thank you Silvio for being here today with us. How are you? So doing excellent. Thank you, Jamina, for the opportunity. Thank you for being here. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your career path and how you got to where you are today? Oh, it's a long career. <laughs> so, so initially I was a, um, I did my PhD in Argentina in the University of Buenos Aires, doing extremely, extremely basic classical um, uh, GPCR biology, working on alpha two and, and adrenergic receptors in in hypertension, mm -hmm. uh, modulating. So, in Argentina is where initially the first description of the alpha two presynaptic adrenergic receptors were made. So there was a big school uh, in pharmacology, so I got my PhD there, and then I moved to NIH as a postdoc, um, and uh, when I moved there, I um, went up one step, in the sense I focused mostly in, in the CNS, okay. um, working in neurobiology, but again, GPCR was the focus, mostly angiotensin, and, and remaining working on cardiovascular, in the sense of angiotensin receptors in the brain, in um, neurobiology, but in concept of um, a regulation of blood pressure control, um, focusing on the um, brain uh, neuropeptide receptors. And from there, I, um, um, I, I took, took a very, very initial um, um, change. So I was taking a class um, on, um, um, so at an IH, a class on um, uh, hormones, receptors, and modulation, etc. So it was very, very exciting, appropriate for for my training, and um, and there was a one class on oncogenes, and it was very cold winter in in Washington D.C. in Bethesda, and and then you say, what the heck am I doing? Cold and listening to oncogenes, and, and at the end of the class, I fell in love with oncogenes, and and then I switch, um, and I was I was I had an opportunity to move to the Cancer Institute. Um, at the NIH and CI, where it was a time of the discovery of most of the oncogenes. So in, in the context of viral oncogenes, et cetera. And, and with that, it was very interesting switch. Uh, molecular biology became my technique, et cetera. And, but from there, I became absolutely focused on cancer. And so initially working on non-receptor tarsin kinases. And, and then um, I was given the opportunity to um, basically as a successful postdoc, uh, you negotiate, and I was given the opportunity to do something by, by myself, if you will, in wow. addition to working on, on, on the main topics of the lab, and I started working on GPCRs as oncogenes. So at that time, there was very few, only one paper on the mass oncogene, nobody really followed that, and I was given that opportunity. So like, like a side project, uh, while complying or working on, on exciting projects within the lab. And it worked. So basically, um, I was given the opportunity then to move to the Dental Institute, where I helped establish an oral cancer program. 
and the opportunity to start beginning to develop a program on that. So, and, and then GPCRs in cancer became what I have been working since uh, ever since. And I, I went through the ranks and became, um, I, I got tenure when I was very young mm -hmm. and very lucky and, um, and then become um, eventually branch chief, which is um, equivalent to like department chair. Um, and I was branch chief for many years working on GPCRs in cancer and oral cancer that was uh, part of our mission. Mm -hmm. And very recently in 2015, I left NIH and moved to UCSD um, uh, following my, my, shall I say, our teams. So uh, 12 people came with me uh, from NIH. So that was, um, we call, um, um, so it, it was it, it was a big move. And um, so, but it essentially, um, uh, we established our lab here at the Cancer Center, where I'm Associate Director for Basic Science. In the same time, working with my colleagues in pharmacology, uh, you name all of them. And, um, and working on GPCRs in cancer. So that's how I ended up, we ended up as a team here. That's fantastic. So every, 12 people moved with you cross country. Yeah. <laughs> how, how much do you think the weather versus the love for GPCRs led them to move with you? Well, for, first we call Operation Exodus, just to give you an <laughs> idea, <laughs> because it was a big move. Many people can drive in, I can fly in, so that was easier. Um, <laughs> It, it was so. It was probably neither it was it was probably the the passion for for a re, shall I say retaining our team. It was very very active. People li like each other a lot, and and everybody was already beginning to be successful. Some very successful. A few people stay. One of them stay with a tenure track position at NIH, uh, um, in, in, at NCI, and several others. So we were able to identify positions for everybody. Um, those that did not come here. Uh, but the idea was to retain the team and, and to be honest with you i have other opportunities and everybody um persuaded me that among the opportunities the weather probably encouraged everybody to select ucsd as compared to other uh, locations but everybody uh, came with us yeah it that's was great true. that's great so you had mentioned uh, just a minute ago that when when you moved and you started working on oncogenes you, you started working on this very tricky project that involved GPCRs and in cancer. At that time, were you the only one who was f thinking about GPCRs and their role in cancer? Probably, the, the answer is always no. Many people were thinking about it, but, but the reality was only one, at that time, one publication, the mass oncogene, showing so from the Wiggler's lab, it was a very nice cell paper. The, the old days in which you can grind the tumor, transfect into cells, get the focus or, or, or few foci, Yep. And, and then you sequence, and then you end up um, identifying an oncogene, and you, you, you were able to publish a paper in cell. But, 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 but the reality is that, besides that, the technical aspect, uh, very few people really were really focusing on that. And the main reason was because the mass oncogene did not have any mutations. And so that, um, at that time, there were wonderful publications, and some that you can say were, were questionable in the sense that relevance to cancer was questionable. In this particular case, Probably people did not embrace, and it became like a well. It happens, so be it. Um, and so very people explore, and, and that was basically how we started. Under the very simple concept, is the very simple concept is that GPCRs do not need to be mutated to be oncogenic. All you need to have is expression, aberrant expression usually, uh, expression in the wrong place at the wrong time, in concomitant um, excess of ligand, either produced locally like an autocrine mechanism or paracrine, we call this oncocrine these days. It's an old term, oncocrine signaling, or, 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 or just um, uh, circulating. So if you have, um, you don't need. So the, the, the most surprising um, issue was when, when doing these focus formation assays, everybody was doing at that time to identify oncogenes, is that when, when if you do compare um, transforming efficiency of, I use the mascarinic uh, receptors, especially, and the reason I use masculine receptors is because the carbon goal was so cheap and so stable. It is. <laughs> if you did with any other receptor, it will take forever and it would be so expensive. So carbon goal, you can boil it and still act it. <laughs> and so that was the reason I selected masculine receptors. But the bottom line is, is if you looked into the number of foci that you get, which was our way to measure the transforming potential, was amazing. Similar to RAS or many other oncogenes. So it was really, the shape of the, the foci were different. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very clear, you can distinguish them, but the number, it was just phenomenal. So that was really shocking, not 
one or two here and there and, and, and you go from there, it was just gazillion. So you need to dilute a lot of the DNA. So it, it really prompted us to, or, or our, I mean, at that time we were very few, it was one or two, <laughs> my team, um, to, to like, what the heck? It was uh, our reaction. And, and that was why we, the, the answer was probably no. Uh, most people were not working on that. In, in, in even today, so probably it's, it's a little bit underexplored, which is, which is a, um, something being underexplored or underexploited means it's an opportunity. So exactly. that, that's exactly, exactly the way we see it. So it, it gives you an opportunity to, to, to make a point and explore GPCRs in the context of cancer. That was actually one of my questions is, how does the cancer community, who's mostly focused on mutated proteins, um, think about GPCRs that are overexpressed in these cancers? So I, I think it's changing. So the so so what what is the what, what is the turning point? In in, in certainly the turning point is a, a cancer genomics. So with the revolution of a few years ago, the ability to sequence uh, cancer genomes, and more recently, in availability from TCGA and other um, international, um, in, in, you can say, operations in in, in, in this area. And in com combined with the use of uh, bioinformatic tools, that, that changed completely because for the first time, A, we do see that there are many copy number variations um, in specific GPCR, in specific, very specific um, cancers. This is not just widespread, it's very specific cancer types. We can see copy number variations, increases uh, with the expression levels, um, and, and we are beginning to see the rationale behind that. Uh, but also, uh, we can see many mutations in GPCRs. 20% of the cancers have mutations in GPCRs. It's much more than we ever expected. So that, that was initially, uh, in, we published in, a, in, in, in um, Nature Reviews in Cancer in 2015, um, together with Tracy Handel here in SECAR in um, Genentech. So they helped with a lot of the bioinformatics. That was eye-opening. And the part that became even more, no, I won't call eye-opening, like duh, so it's that we start seeing patterns of mutations in G proteins now. They are very, they are very hot spot. They are similar to RAS. So it's like in a sense, it's, it's a single nucleotide is always mutated um, in GS and in, in, in GQ primarily, GQ11. Uh, so we see very hot spot mutations and in that there are some cancers that now we know and everybody knows it's not what we know is the community accepts. They are driven by G proteins. So that, that is a, so the concept that there are cancers that are driven by G proteins change the land the landscape in terms of understanding and appreciation. In, in the other part that align with that is the fact that many G proteins and some GPCRs are part of the current sequencing panels. So mo mo most cancer patients, um, at least in UCSD, when, when they have the tumors, usually they will be sequenced. And so, but they don't do whole genome sequence. In general, they do a panel of or 500 genes. Wow. So there are many companies do that um, in, in, in house as well. But, but this is very frequent. Most big cancer center will sequence. There are several G proteins, so GLPHA S13, Q and 11, they are part of the panel. And that means there are many, many new cancers. People have no idea. They don't have a driver oncogene, all of a sudden, wow, they have a GQ, GS mutations, etc. And so the people are beginning to appreciate. They don't know what it means. And but, but in, we're beginning to understand, in, 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 uh, but, but, but people are now, the cancer genomics again, uh, raised to the, the bar in the sense that there are mutations, they are there, and they are causal. So they do contribute and in, or initiate cancer. And so that's why it changed a lot. And that's, and that's new, and we're learning more and more about G-proteins, about the fact that they go to the nucleus and, and they do things there. So I think it's, it's a good... It's, a, it's good to be able to identify these mutations, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done in order to understand how these mutations drive cancer. So that, that gets me to, to my next question. Do you have a favorite G protein? So um, it's almost like, let me say, very simple, I have two daughters. It's like asking which one you like most. Mm -hmm. um, I love both of them uh, the, same, the same way. So, so, so they, 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 asking what is your favorite is, you may be neglecting another one. So this was, so I would say that we have our favorite G proteins, as precisely as I was telling, um, saying so that because they do have mutations, drive mutations, the ones that we love is a G alpha Q, or the, most of the um, medical community don't call it G alpha Q, 
they call based on the name, it's called GNAQ. Also, and, and if you ask um, uh, medical students, don't even know what the GNAQ is, they call it GNAQ. <laughs> well. So you need to learn, we need to learn the language so to communicate. So when, because I was giving a talk recently on, in, on G alpha Q and then I said, so, so G N A Q and then, oh, that's GNAC. Yes, that's GNAC. So G alpha Q11 uh, and the other ones, G alpha S, um, it mutated many cancers, happy to discuss. And then in, in terms of the GPCRs, it has been, usually we have been focused on model GPCRs. So we, we never really focus on one GPCR. Now we are changing a little bit based, based on our interest, should I say new interest or renew interest or just no interest in, um, in chemical receptors in, in immune oncology. And so in that case, probably we are falling in love in, in, in with the uh, CXR3 and XCR1. So these are the two ones that we are uh, beginning to start to really focus on in the context of cancer immunology. This was, so I will say these four will be very different from each other and, and we, we embrace them, all of them, we love them. That's, that's great. You can have more than one GPCR or G protein love. I particularly am fond of CXCR3. I've worked on uh, deciphering or dissecting the signaling of CXCR3 splice variants, which I find also very interesting about you know, why a cell would decide to make three variants of a chemokine receptor. Uh, absolutely. And this is absolutely for cancer immunology. You, the, the world may not be even aware that CXCR3 is central to cancer immunology, for example. It was so, um, happy to talk, to talk more about it, so okay. absolutely. Of course, so since we're talking about CXCR3, what is the current status of research about on this receptor in the context of cancer immunology? What so so if I tell you about CXCR3, most, um, most people would not, I mean, most, uh, um, shall I say, most scientists or um, physicians working in cancer will not, will, will not resonate with CXCR3. Mm -hmm. But as if I tell you six year, CXCL10, 11, and 9, uh, or IP10, it was called CXCL10, so it's um, interferon use 10. Everybody will know that these three genes are central to the response of, of immune therapies. Everybody is perfectly aware that if you, if you can measure CXCL10, 11, and 9, in pre-existing levels prior to immune therapy is part of the most, shall I say, robust signature predicting that is a, a cancer will be responding, say uh, melanoma or many other cancers, lung cancer, etc. Most of them is part of the, even the panel that are being used by, by some pharmaceutical companies as a predictive marker. So it's part of the predictive marker, but it's one of the best predictive markers of response. And so, and, and then the reason is, I mean, you say, duh, uh, because these are the ligands for CXR3. Exactly. And so because these three ligands are the ligands for CXR3, and CXR3 is expressed primarily in, in NK cells and in, in, in T cells, CD8 positive T cells. So it's expressed in other, but it's usually the good, the good immune, so, so you have the good ones and the bad ones, uh, CXR3 is in the good ones. So it's an express in the, in the um, NK cells, that would be the first responders, if you will, in, in, in uh, cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells is very highly expressed. And, and the reason is very simple. You have the ligand being produced in response to interferon, or it usually is part of the sting pathway. There is a lot of research being done. The sting pathway will activate this um, expression through interferon response of these chemokines, and that will recruit um, the, the T cells and K cells uh, to fight the cancer. So th that's why that may be the main reason. So, and, and there are many opportunities which to the best of my knowledge, are still underexploited. So there is a very recent paper in using six year three knockout uh, mice, and basically they found that there's no response to anti um, anti PD one or anti CTL four, for example. So that that's a primary, I would say, that raises the bar in terms of the need to target that particular uh, receptor. Definitely, definitely, it's it's one of my favorites. Absolutely. In that, in that case. I, I check your papers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a lot of a lot of uh, fun working on that paper, and it, it's one of my favorites. And you know, it's important. This receptor is also important in IBD and in all of these immune diseases. And I always wondered why people aren't working on it. I'm, I'm glad that it became more and more important now. So it's beginning to be part of our our um, lab work. 
but again, so it, one of the reasons, so sometimes you go with the, um, with the flow, sometimes you lead the flow, uh, you lead the pack, and sometimes you have opportunities. In this case, the opportunity is that based on our interest in oral cancer, which we're still very heavily invested into, uh, in, in new animal models, in, in clinical trials that we are conducting for hetanic cancer in, in the context of cancer immunology, now we have the opportunity to investigate specifically that. And so that is why we are refocusing on those receptors. That's fantastic. And tell me more about one or two of your G proteins that, that are... So the, the, the most exciting right now, so of course, the G-alpha-S is very exciting. You will see much more coming. It's, it's the most widely mutated uh, G protein in cancer. Uh, in almost many, many cancers, there are a, a fraction. Um, the, most, the, the best one is uh, um, appendix cancer. It's almost 70%. Pancreatic cancer is around 12%. Colon cancer is around 4 to 5%, but there are so many colon cancer cases. That is very, very important. But the one where we're making a, a big um, push right now is G-alpha-Q. So it's mutated. So the lights turn on. Um, GNAC. <laughs> yeah, GNAC. So it's mutated primarily in uvel melanoma. So it's the driver of melanoma of the eye, which is the most prevalent cancer in adults in the eye. 50% um, will develop metastasis in the liver and is fulminant. So once metastasized, um, this 50%, the, the life expectancy is around six months to one year max. So it's really fulminant. And, and so the, um, there's a lot to be done with the GLFQ, number one, number two. Also four to around 4% 4 of cutaneous uh, melanoma have mutations in GLFQ, which are absolutely under under-investigated, under-appreciated in both of them, but mostly in the liver melanoma, they do not respond to immune therapies, and in particularly in liver melanoma, melanoma of the eye. So the number of mutations in, in, in total, so usually most cancer you have four, 500 mutations, 600, 1,000, you name it. In the, in, in, the, in the melanoma of the eye, there are only four, five mutations. So it's almost like a childhood type of cancer, the driver is alpha Q, 93% or Q or 11. You have 93% of mutations in alpha Q. It's a single amino acid, 209. Very few have 183, but the vast majority, almost 90% are 209. Very precise, hotspot mutation. The mix, the, makes the, the G protein constitutively active because it prevents the, the uh, GTPS activity. So it's a canonical activated mutation. So in the other mutations are in, in the... Um, RNA splicing molecules that regulate RNA splicing or um, modifiers of epigenetics. So it's the driver. And in that context, there are no therapies currently available. Uh, people are continuing dying. There are several uh, treatments, uh, se several uh, clinical trials that were conducted. Um, and perhaps a little bit, this is where the science um, can come and, and it's when you need to be open-minded. Uh, I know that's a canonical GLFQ um, signaling or, or scientist or student, you will always put PLC and, and then PKC and then you go from there, ERK and whatever is your choice. Um, we were a little bit more open-minded. We run a, 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 um, a, a siRNA screen or DSRNA screen in Drosophila cells to try to um, investigate what's really involved in terms of we knew AP1 was important, a transcription factor. And, and what we found is that there is another component completely different, it's called, the molecule is called TRIO. And so the idea is that GQ will activate PLC. That's very important, but every attempt to target that have failed in the clinic in the sense of, of not having an impact. I'm not saying it's not important, I'm saying that, that this targeting that alone is not sufficient. And so in the most recent publications, etc. so we, 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 we team up with people who are brilliant doing bioinformatics, and so we did some synthetic lethality analysis using all in silico, not even running a single uh, CRISPR analysis, and, and we came up with some new ideas. But the take-home message is that in addition to the canonical pathway, there is a very poorly investigated non-canonical pathway through the activation of this exchange factor called TRIO that activates RO and to some extent RAC, but mostly it's RO. And, and then RO will activate many things. The one that, together with the other team here, uh, independently, in, in, in our lab, we showed the YAP was central in addition to AP1. In more recent, our most recent studies, looking for draggable because YAP is wonderful, but it's not draggable uh, in the part of the HIPPO pathway, which we did not expect before. Um, so we 
did it, this um, 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 bioinformatic uh, bioinformatic approach to do synthetic lethal interactions. We found a protein called FAK, focal adhesion kinase, was central to activation of of, of YAP, and uh, downstream from GQ in in, in the in raw. So that led to a clinical trial that was just opened by a by a, 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 a team. And our own clinical trial will be uh, open relatively soon, both uh, based on our this observation. So, again, so you need to be open-minded. And if you go to the textbook, you will see PLC. Stay with that, fine. <laughs> but for the immediate effects, but for cancer and probably for many things that involve cell growth promotion, can be um, 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 hyperproliferation, can be many other diseases. Um, the trio raw pathway that is very poorly investigated is also central. Wow, and what is the, um, so in UVL melanoma, if I remember correctly, uh, there have been reports of um, the cis-LTR2 receptor being mutated and being constitutively active. How does that the receptor fit with the GQ um, mutation? Yeah, I was saying so 93% so have GLFAQ. The few ones that don't have GLFAQ, they have a mutation in CYLSTR2, which is a typical canonical GQ activate. And so it's perfectly, so it's a, canon, it's a single nucleotide mutation. Um, all of the patients have a, a one place where it's mutated. That a receptor is now being sequenced as well as part of the panels. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a GQ, so it's a very small number, but fits perfectly well with the GQ. And... Um can they be mutated at the same time, or it's usually They're just one or the other? Mutually exclusive. So GLFA Q and GLFA 11, they're almost identical. They are 40 something percent each. They are mutually exclusive. Okay. And they are also mutually exclusive with CYL STR2. So they are, is one or the other. It's not that they cannot be mutated, it's that there is no gain to be mutated. So in cancer, we, we, we often use mutual exclusivity as an indication. That, that there is no gain in, in this enough with one of them in saying is they're complementary. Definitely, that's, that it seemed like the mutation in CCLTR2 was very similar driving UVL melanoma just as the GLFAQ. Um, um, I'd love to hear more about the clinical trials that you're conducting looking at GLFAQ, the mutated GLFAQ. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, so, so the, the, the trial, one trial was just open based on these findings from, from um, so one have to understand so that the, you can call it, um, at the end of the day, the, the cancer patient is, the, is, is really what we need to help. Who does it, when, when, who benefits financially, who takes the credit, who, th these are details that will be in few, few months, few years, will be less, less relevant. So the important issue again, so that several trials were conducted blocking primarily blocking a MEC as part of the ERK pathway. All of them fail in terms of progression-free survival in, in, um, in, in survival of the patients. Uh, three independent uh, trials were conducted. Um, two PKC trials were conducted. One, uh, initially there were some toxicities. In a recent trial, there are less toxicities and, and yet very limited activity, some activity, uh, but limited. Um, so, so basically, saturating, if you will, the, the canonical pathway seemed not to be sufficient. That's the message. So with, based on our study with FAK, so the, there are several companies that have FAK um, inhibitors in their pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, We're working with one of them ourselves, but, but basically there, there are many for different indications, so for fibrosis, uh, to enhance response to immune therapies because the antifibrotic effect. So they're already, and the safety is very high. They have very limited toxicities. You know, it's not, it's not aspirin. Aspirin also has toxicities, but it's not. Uh, it does. <laughs> um, but, but they are very limited toxicity when compared uh, to other uh, conventional um, uh, cancer therapies. Okay. And so uh, based on our publication, so the, even before the publication, based on abstracts presented, one company started already a clinical trial, of developing a clinical trial that was just open in three centers, a focus on FAK, um, and, and they plan in the future to combine with a typical MEK inhibitors. In our case, our trial um, we are developing, so, so the trial is ready to be submitted very soon. Uh, the company is sponsoring the trial, 
Um, so it will be FK inhibitor, a different FK inhibitor. For some reasons, we believe it will be better. Um, the only reason is because it blocks another kind is called PTK2B. Uh, PTK2 is the gene, gene name for FK. PTK2B, uh, you may know better as PK2, which is very typical, also has been reported a long time ago by uh, Jossi Schlesinger to be downstream uh, from GQ couple receptors, just to give an idea, which is poorly expressed in, in uval melanoma, but we think that this dual activity would be better because it's a chance that you block FK, PTK2, PTK2B may be, um, be a, may rescue. So we feel that blocking both would be important. And in recent studies are unpublished, so we are ready to submit soon. So we, we did a CRISPR screen to identify what can, can, what can you do to enhance the response to um, FAK. Uh, the paper has been submitted, I, I should say. Um, and, and so what we found is that uh, targeting the canonical pathway was the best way to synergize. So we'll be using a different MEK inhibitor. It's, it's experimental, it's not approved. But the advantage of this second MEK inhibitor is we think it's more potent because blocks the make rough interaction, preventing the overactivation of the pathway, which usually is what have a, a led in, in melanoma. They have big rough mutations have led to um, resistance. So we think this would be almost like the perfect match. Um, and uh, the, there is also from this note that we're there's some uh, preliminary data using this combination that shows some activity, I cannot disclose more than that in some cancers, uh, some interesting activity, I shall I say, um, but, but also limited toxicities. So this why, so we feel this may be the winner combination. Uh, hopefully we can conduct the trial. And we already have the preliminary information about toxicities, dosing, so there are many, in terms of drug development and, and advancing to the clinic, so these are uh, very important components that they will accelerate the process of the trial. So that, that's our perspective. That's great. So it's a combination therapy yeah. and uh, of potentially repurposed drugs at this point. Yeah. That's, that's great because you're, 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 you know, jumping hoops and stepping over the whole toxicity, toxicity uh, issues. What do you think at this moment are the biggest hurdles in treating these cancers and advancing research to understand the function of these proteins, of G proteins or GPCRs in cancer. Hey everyone, just a quick thanks to our sponsor AttilaForest.com, your one-stop primary business performance physician. Get a free consultation today by visiting AttilaForest.com. When we come back, we'll hear more about Silvio's thoughts on using GPCRs as drug targets in the context of cancer. Make sure you share, like, and hit the subscribe button to get the latest Dr. GPCR podcast episodes delivered directly as they become available. You can also visit us at drgpcr.com slash podcast to learn more about past and upcoming shows, our guests, or if you'd like to be featured in an episode, we'd love to hear from you. Get in touch with us today at drgpcr.com slash podcast. I think there are no, no roadblocks. It's, it's basically, there are, no, there are no real roadblocks. It's a, it's a mindset. I think it's a mindset so that the um, so it's a mindset in the sense that the often often not always if most people working on GPCRs don't work on cancer they use cancer cells 293s are cancer cells okay uh, but most people work on GPCR they don't fully work on cancer so they use cancer cells as a test a case uh, but the cancer has a lot of new uh, details that sometimes escape to someone who uh, focuses on the biochemistry of function of GPCRs. So are many details that are very important uh, that you need to embrace. And on the other hand, again, most people with GPCRs don't work on cancer. And most people with cancer don't work on GPCRs. So I think that the Renault is, is a perfect, perfect match to start developing together uh, in the community to develop this, this understanding and, and, and exploiting uh, uh, GPCRs in cancer and G-proteins. I, I, perhaps one approach, so if you ask me what is missing, a is the acceptance in the, in the cancer community um, of, of, of embracing the, the, the prospect of GPCRs being in G proteins being important in cancer, which is slowly advancing based on genetics, genomics, etc. As I was telling you, but the other is, is to have a real so the problem so G proteins are easy so targeting is difficult but G proteins are easy because there are few uh, four classes of G proteins beta gammas of course beautiful. 
you can embrace, you give it the name, GNAC, GNAQ, GNAS, yeah. and, and perfect, you can embrace, anyone can embrace. GPCRs, because the number of GPCRs themselves, these different classes, and, and because they are, with the exception of CYLSTR2, there are very few hotspot mutations in, in cancer. It's very difficult for the community to embrace them. So that's why, so we, we, we try to go back to, um, she say, back to the future, <laughs> trying to reemphasize the issue of this, this, the issue that maybe mutations may not be set, the only thing that activate GPCR and focusing specifically on the, on the possibility of these oncocrine networks where ligands secreted locally, call it chemokines, call it, um, call it um, neurotransmitters, um, beta-2 adrenergic receptors are important for some cancers and prostaglandin receptors we feel are really important, etc. So the idea is, is to embrace this concept of the oncocrine or autocrine paracrine signaling that may facilitate cancer or even in some cases may even initiate. And so in that is bringing to the concept of cancer immunology is even better because again, so now it makes a lot of sense that the, for the immune cells to be recruited they don't go by chance to the tumor. They're recruited, and they're recruited by chemokines, like this um, back to the future again. So the concepts are very simple. Uh, the, even if the inactivated, even a CAR T is ready to go to kill a cancer, unless it's recruited, nothing's going to happen. So that's why, so I think embracing this, in, 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 I know that sometimes it's difficult because the names are a little bit uh, funny. Uh, nobody knew about PD-1 before. Nobody knew about CTLA-4. Um, maybe having a number or having another name, um, but, but for example, going to 6CR3, if you explain about the, um, the 6 year 11 so 10, 11, and 9 being so central, which everybody embraces already, that's perfect, and then you express the 6CR3 central to that response, then people start beginning to embrace. So that's what we think is missing. So communication, in in, um, in 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 embracing number, you know that would be one of the issues. The way we try to overcome that is by cataloging. In cataloging is very important. De developing data sets or databases. So we recently published a paper in in JVC, and, and the main reason of some of my colleagues asked why you publish that in JVC. It's very simple. When we publish the other paper in Nature Reviews in Cancer, my colleagues working on GPCRs usually don't read it. <laughs> so it's cancer centric. So I say, okay, let's go to hardcore where we, what we all read and make it absolutely available. So it's all freely available. All of the data sets are there or yep. where, are, where are expressed. We are doing, continue working on that in, 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 in the context of cancer immunology, uh, but by cataloging, showing, um, making available these data sets, people can, 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 can really see um, where are they expressed, which cells express the cells, when are they expressed, uh, whether in responder versus non responders. So you can put some flavors that are clinically relevant, and this is what we want to achieve. So make it available. We focus ourselves on some, um, in, 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 in happy to share uh, the field. So it's not that we want really, it's a competition, it's really moving the field forward. I agree. I think communication is key. And I think the biggest issue in science and working on GPCRs and in cancer is the availability of that information and how fast you can get the information and how fast you can, you know, form partnerships with, with the experts like yourself, for example. Um, yeah. If you had to wish for a drug, would you want a drug that targets a GPCR or would you prefer having a drug that targets a G protein? And what are the difficulties of, of having a good drug? So, so regarding the, the G proteins, um, the G proteins of GQ is the one, G alpha Q is the one we're studying. Um, so certainly this is a signal transduction driven cancer, UV uh, melanoma. So if you, if you will, it will be almost like the best example of a signal transduction driven cancers in terms of mutations, in terms of any other, this is a driver. So then intracellular signaling is what you want to accomplish. You want to kill the cancer cell, but not the, um, not the normal cells. And this is the concept of precision uh, therapy or precision medicine. So again, UV melanoma, I think, is the best example uh, of, of precision medicine where you need to target only the, primarily the pathways in, in, that in, in the, specifically in these cancer cells, which I think is doable. Um, if you go to GPCRs, I think that the big explosion right now would be with the use of um, 
two things. One is antibodies, targeting antibodies. So the first example was CCR4. So a megamulizumab was the first antibody, was FDA approved targeting GPCRs. Right now it's very focused on one particular subset of, um, of um, a, a cancers, very, very small subset, if you will. Um, but, but the reality is that, that that opens the use of antibodies blocking GPCR or stimulating GPCRs. Uh, antibodies, I think, in the long term, that will be probably the future, given the huge specificity and in, 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 in possibilities of long-term use, etc. So there are many, many reasons why antibody would be the long term. The long term and the short term, probably more than canonical blockers or, or, or agonist antagonists, the possibility of, of um, molecules that would be modulating them. So the, that would be allosteric modulators of GPCRs would be probably the way to go in the sense that you, you don't block uh, every GPCR in, in the body, you block only, you modulate, you know, turn on, turn off a little bit, modulate rather than block. Um, for example, for chemokine receptors, we think this is the way to go. So you can turn it on a little bit, and so there will be more responses to the locally produced ligands. Turn it, I mean, not turning, tuning. Sure. That would be what you want to do, to tune up, tune, tune down. Probably that is the best way to go, so in the, uh, in the future. So basically, allosteric modulators, uh, would be one one area uh, for GPCRs, which is uh, exploding right now, um, and, and the other one would be eventually um, um, antibodies, targeting antibodies. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it sounds like a like a good good path forward. When it comes to uh, allosteric modulators to tune the function of the receptors, I mean, I guess you need a structure to try and find a modulator. Uh, an allosteric modulator site, uh, how much do we know about potential sites and how much do we know on how much we want to tune, for example, receptor function in the case of CXCR3, for example? So, so, so hey, that, uh, that would not be me. I don't work on structural uh, biology of GPCR, but then it's when partnerships or collaborations are fantastic. And so, so we're working here with uh, Tracy Handel. Mm -hmm. uh, she's the expert in chemokine receptors in the structure. And she can close her eyes and tell me precisely where to mutate, and we are doing that. So I, I would not be able to do. So this is the, the typical case where you would like to. You, it's not you would like to. You have to collaborate with um, like-minded um, colleagues, scientists, in, in 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 quite often wonderful friends, which is always helps. Um, but but at the end of the day, I think there is enough. It, it will not be general, but for different receptor subtypes, for which there is already many many uh, structures. I, I think there is already the opportunity to start predicting this. So this is also based on our work um, in terms of coupling, for example. So it's a paper uh, together with my colleagues in Japan, in, in Germany, which is published in Cell. So we, we use, um, um, uh, you can call artificial intelligence or, or other approaches. So to, um, um, to identify structure determinants of coupling, for example, that gives you a very um, excellent um, I will get an example of, of that this is doable. So if you have a lot of structural information, you can use, it's, it's called machine learning. So you can use machine learning approaches combined with the, with the, with the uh, wet lab experiments guided by this and then uh, reformulating the, the equations that you use. I, I think this is a combination that would be is, is a winner. So having um, people who are doing a lot of crystal structures, they have the expertise, they, they know and feel every amino acid, what they will do. Uh, you can ask my colleagues here. I will not give you all of the names, but they, they really know what they do, combined with a, with a more experimental approach, targeting that, and, and probably machine learning approaches um, to come up with overriding, um, a, um, you can say, trends or, or, or perspective of how can you modulate. Definitely. I mean, using machine learning reduces the number of experiments that you can you, you have to do in the lab. And at the same time, the processing information processing capability of a computer very much exceeds our ability to to do pipetting and then and then screening. But for that, as you had mentioned, uh, you need a good crystal structure. And you need the team. Uh, obviously, obviously. So well, this, we have a computational people in Germany now moving to Italy and um, in our colleagues in Japan doing high throughput screens in, um, in, in our emphasis in terms of uh, biology. So it was a perfect, and, and 
each one contributed to that. So it's in from different perspectives. So this is what you needed, different expertise and, and team effort. Definitely, it goes back to communication and, and being wanting to, to form partnerships to advance drug discovery and understanding yep. you know, the role of these proteins and these signaling cascades in, in diseases like cancer. You had mentioned pancreatic cancer. It's basically a death sentence getting, getting a, a diagnosis of that. Um, uh, you had mentioned that while at NIH, you went uh, to this class in the middle of winter and you became enamored with, with oncogenes. That, to me, was kind of an aha moment that you had mentioned and that shaped your career. Were there any moments in your career that you could uh, qualify as aha moments? So it's, it's not easy that I'm almost every day in science is cool, but, but, but probably the, the one that was, <laughs> is, so old fashioned, if you will, using cost cells, transfecting with, so, so the, because the idea of the ERK, how ERK or MAP kinase is regulated by G proteins. And um, so the, there were, you know, few papers hidden there and it was very confusing. And, and, and focus on GI couple receptors. Everybody knew you take a GI couple receptor, you stimulate with the ligand, you get ERK activation or MAP kinase at the time. And then um, you block that with pertussis toxin, and it's very easy. G GI is, is involved, nobody will argue. And so then doing, uh, working on something else, so we start expressing G alpha I mutant in wild type, et cetera, in cost cells, we didn't see any activation of ERK. And, and, and you know, no matter how you do, Western blood here, Western blood there, DNA, new preps, whatever, mutant here, mutant there, we couldn't see any activation. So I said, what the heck? And then one, one day you start reading how uh, pertussis toxin works, um, that basically ADP ribosylates the C-terminus, preventing G-protein coupling uh, to the receptor. And you say, what the heck? So maybe it's not the, G, not the alpha, maybe it's the beta-gamma. And, and at that time it was very controversial what beta-gamma did or did not do, and very, very um, uh, interesting arguments in the context of meetings of about what they were not doing. And I said, what the heck, let's do it. And so one of my colleagues at the, in, in, at NIDDK, so he had all of the beta gammas already expressing for a different reason, let's give it a shot. And we express the betas and the gammas, no really, and then we combine, wow, for the first time we saw ERG activation. And only betas, not beta five, but mostly beta one, beta two, anyone but beta five, which makes sense, and, and only with the, um, Gamma, there was not a gamma one, there's only in the, in the eye. And in only meristillation, so it had to be uh, modulated. So but they would have a lot of controls afterwards. But the first was that beta gamma alone, but not alphas were able to activate ERK. That was, happened to be our first nature paper. So there was wow. still, uh, it was not easy to publish because we were not known in the community. So that was probably one in, in aha moment. Um, Probably the second similar to what the heck I had moment was when, um, when uh, working on June kinase. So when ERK was the first kinase to identify in the MAP kinase pathway, the second one was June kinase. And it was part of the June kinase was activated by RAS in cell papers, etc. It was very, very um, compelling. And so we tested in GPCR, they activated June kinase extremely well. Perfect. Uh, but much better than PDGF or EGF that activates very poorly, but very well ERK. So there was a disconnect between the two. And so one day I said, okay, let's do again our um, analysis and we put RAS we, and, and, and we saw, you know, a two-fold increase in ERK and in Junkanis activation. If you remove the background, multiply by the number of times you do and select the right example, Oh, you can find that there was an activation, but I would say just two, four, two, three, four max. And in GPCRs will activate GQ caprosato specifically, and G13 will activate 10 times, so we couldn't justify. And so then what the heck? So we, we collected, we have a number of oncogenes in the lab uh, from the, the call the DBL, OST, BAF, etc. We have many oncogenes because I, I work at the cancer center, so we have many of these in our fridge. And, and most of them did not, although publishing very well-known journals, you name it, some of them inducing ERK because it was very popular at that time. Everything will act, go through ERK. We didn't see much activation. I said, well, these oncogenes do not, do not activate ERK, but they do activate beautifully June kinase. Something else should be there. 
And so, and we collect the raw GTPases, what's emerging, the raw GTPases may be acting downstream from these oncogenes, not the RAS. And, um, and, and that was fantastic. So we show basically raw RAC CC42, mostly RAC and CC42. We're able to activate extremely highly June kinase, almost no activation of ERP. And so that was, that was our first cell paper, uh, still our most cited paper. So it was all based on what the heck, um, this doesn't make sense. And, and that basically is just being open-minded, not try to push anything in order to publish. Uh, it's really getting deeper and, and really question yourself. Maybe we are doing something wrong. Number one, of course, is possible. Maybe we're not doing something wrong. Maybe the concepts we are basing our experiments on may not be correct. And that is when you have huge opportunities to be breakthrough discoveries. Both of them are, are very um, recognized and highly cited. But the, the bottom line, those were probably very exciting moments. That's great. So speaking of aha moments and looking back through to, to all these papers, if you had a young scientist right now in front of you, what would be your advice um, it's to them so that they can, you know, jump on the train and start contributing to the field. Be open-minded and follow your heart. <laughs> and so, and, and don't, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, read, certainly, you have to read a lot, but you need to make, slowly try to distinguish what's published and what's, I would call it real, in the sense of, get the sense of, because many, many times, many findings, don't, 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 don't pay attention to the impact factor of the journals pay attention to the impact, how many, you know, who reproduced, who did not, etc., or which context. Sometimes it's nothing wrong, but it's a very con context dependent. So try to be extremely open-minded, read, but mostly think. So that would be the most important. And, and try to follow your heart. And, and if you find something that doesn't, doesn't match the expectation based on the publications, based on all of this, but you think it's relevant. Relevant in my case, would be in our case, would be mostly based on cancer and cell proliferation. Some other case would be neurotransmission. Some other case would be, I mean, so it's not only cancer, of course. Something, so the biological relevance and in translational potential, in, I will argue, maybe the major drivers of deciding where to focus, but the how to focus and how to um, have fun, um, do your experiments, plan it, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Don't, don't, you don't need to do a knockout to, to prove a point. Prove it anywhere and then be ready. But mo mostly be open-minded. Open-minded and, and be f absolutely f uh, free and, 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 and enjoy uh, challenging uh, pre-existing uh, dogmas that may have been established for in a very specific um, uh, area, in very specific cells, very specific um, context. All right. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, if you have job openings in your lab to join your, your team of 12 that moved cross country with you, where can people find you? Um, that, 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 that is an interesting question. So it happens that so often we do. So now uh, the old days at the NIH, we have a fixed number of um, positions right now. Um, and, and it changes based on reviews, of course, in, um, which is the way intramural scientists are being reviewed and, and, and resources allocated. Yeah. In the extramural is based on, on uh, opportunities, mostly on grants or, or other opportunities, but mostly grants. So we have been very fortunate. Um, we recruited, we have several students and, and they are very extremely um, uh, passionate. So the, the local students based on uh, communication, uh, we do have openings from time to time based on, on the resources. And, and to some extent, I'm not advertising anywhere. So people, I receive emails uh, from colleagues, former students that are now uh, directors of institutes. So I have many of my students are doing amazing everywhere. They're really wonderful people and, and they continue doing science. So I, I'm not posting it almost anywhere. So th that is maybe a mistake because there is a pool of people that don't even think about the potential for applying, the, I'm, I'm missing it myself, and the same is true maybe from my, my colleagues. So it's, it's basically, if, if, you, if, you, if I can give it an advice to a more junior person uh, in training, don't be afraid. So you like a paper, you like the subject, you think the person may be okay, so do it digging um, in, in the web, try to, you know, all, all of the parameters you can you can see in the websites, whether it's a fun place or it's boring place, both of them can be wonderful for you, uh, up to you. Uh, but, but then contact, send an email. Don't be afraid to send emails. Yes, because what's the worst thing that can happen? People can say no, but if you don't send the email, you won't know. 
Exactly. So after I finished talking to you, actually, I have an interview with one, one student, potential candidate that sent me an email a few days ago, and, 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 and I immediately contacted everybody around that person, supervisor, etc. Everybody was very positive. I mean, we will we'll see. And then uh, for me, it's very important that the team interviews the person. We'll be by Zoom, not physically. <laughs> uh, but then so initially I discussed with the person and then the team uh, will, will, will interview because it's important. The team, so the structure of the team is central to making progress. Um, mostly the opportunity for, um, let, let me turn on the, the, the light. So he, he, here, if you don't move, this is California. <laughs> if you don't move, the light then switches off and you do need to, you do, do need to um, uh, continue being active. So even stretch it. <laughs> um, so, so the team is central. So and we are very lucky with the, our, our students. They're, again, they're fantastic, but at the same time, uh, the, the uh, personalities, in, in, in team efforts, and I, I prefer always that the, the, the students and postdocs play a very, very important central role in, in really analyze, in, in, in identifying who they would like to work with for the next two, three, four, five years. So that they will be interviewing. So, don't, you know, as a junior scientist, don't be afraid. Send an email, uh, contact the person, contact the students. At the end of the day, sometimes it's more important to contact the students, uh, get to know, and, and, and move from there. I, I agree. I agree. It's very important to to interview people, but also let the give the opportunity to the interviewee to meet the team, because you'll spend a lot of time together in the lab, and and it has to be a, a collaborative environment, a pleasant environment. Uh, one last question before before we finish today. I know it's not possible at this moment, but if it were, what are the top three, five conferences that you would recommend to going to, or which one are your favorites? So that, that's a, um, personally, I, I, I like small conferences. Um, so big conferences are ideal for job hunting and to get a big picture. Yeah. But, but, but um, I, I have many interests because I have many interests. Um, I, I, if I go to a conference, I, every time I go to a, one lecture, I, I know I'm missing two that I would like to go and I feel guilty all the time. So going to one big lecture, one big meeting, so I would say probably ASPET or EB, mm -hmm. so you get the big picture of everything is going on, especially EB, uh, because ASPET would be the pharmacology, but you have access to all of the other presentations by the other um, organization within um, ASBMB, etc. So you will have access to all of this. Um, that would be one, if possible. And, and on the other hand, I will go to a Gordon conference or a Keystone or some of these industry um, organized meetings that are very targeted. So industry, if you have the opportunity, the resources, um, they're even more targeted, but, but usually are state of the art. And Gordon conference and, and Keystone is where, where I, I try to go. So usually go at least uh, one Gordon conference a year, and, and I encourage people in my lab, uh, especially when I know I'm going to Gordon conference or I have been invited uh, to, to, or it can be FASEP, of course, so don't, don't, yeah. don't get me wrong, FASEP, Gordon conference. So they, they start for 200, 300, 150 number of uh, attendees where you have breakfast, lunch, dinner, you talk to people, you can have a drink, uh, you, you get to know everybody, and that's uh, fantastic, one of the best places. Uh, to, to make the networks also, to develop networks in the future. Uh, definitely. I, I agree with you. I love the smaller conferences like the Great Lakes GPCR retreat. And that's when you can, you know, talk to people and have ended up with um, collaborations issued out of, you know, talks of these posters saying, well, hey, I know you know how to do this. Can, can we work together? Yeah. So this, this cell paper we just published started in a Gordon conference. There was a person doing bioinformatics, uh, doing different type of informatics and, and, and I went to his poster, we started talking, uh, Francesco, he's fantastic. And, and then Aska, my colleague uh, from Japan, I also met him in a Gordon conference. And he had this wonderful new way to test for G-protein couple specificity and, and he has used this for screening some, some drugs, etc. and say, hey, and we form a team based on discussion in the Gordon conference. And of course, the Great Lakes uh, GPCR is, is a wonderful place as well. So it's uh, okay. so the, the concept is more targeted and, and smaller. Um, you you pick and choose which one is closer to you or what, which one is you see people that you you can be 
uh, collaborate in the future with. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for taking the time. This is all the time we had. I really enjoyed our conversation and thank you for, for being here with me today. So thank you, a pleasure. And, 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 and again, so it's, it's wonderful. Remember team effort, but, but the, the, the team is also important. If someone uh, is looking for positions and are really passionate about the work, feel free also uh, to share the, the, just contact me, send an email and maybe there are opportunities. Absolutely. So I will make sure that your email and your contact information is available on the web page with the transcript of our conversation. And I encourage everyone to uh, give you a call and uh, see where that leads. Perfect. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Janina. Bye. Thank you for joining us and listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We would like to thank our guest and our Dr. GPCR team, namely Attila, Ines, Montserrat, Ivana, Andreina, Balint, and Julia. A huge thank you to our Dr. GPCR ecosystem partners for their support, Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. You can connect with our partners directly in the ecosystem, so don't forget to join us today. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter, find us on YouTube, and if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Soon, you'll be able to share the Dr. GPCR University. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.